So here's what I want to talk about today. Superheroes still exist. Mothers matter. Okay, and so here, who here is a mom? And, and when I talk about my mom, I, I look at all of you all that raised your hands, that your moms to children and to cats. Um, and I think of you all um, when I answer the question. Because I believe that heroes do exist and that we, meaning not just me or not just the children that are here, um, but each and every single one of you are living proof because someone else was a hero in your life and sowed seeds of encouragement and empowerment into your life. Uh, and so it's an easy question to answer. Um, the next question is, who will the heroes, who will the leaders be in our generation? Right? You know, I think about my mom who's, who's here, and, and this is me at like six months old, six weeks old, right? Um, in water, which is probably why I don't like swimming now. Um, <laughs> um, and then this is me at two and a half years of age, right? So I'm a, uh, this is our, my special adoption suit that mom went to J.C. Penney to get. Um, and, and she is the reason that I'm here today. She's the reason uh, for a lot of different things in my life. And, and I want you all to know that you are the reasons for a lot of good in a lot of other people's lives as well. Um, and so I like to kind of start out my talks, um, especially when I know that there's going to be a lot of um, young females who are, who are moms who are impactful uh, to many people, um, that you all are a huge part of the fabric of this country. You know, people talk about jobs, and jobs are good. Um, people talk about the economy and, and the different things that are the engine of growth for, the, for this country and for world governments. But if you had to boil it down, uh, if you had to be really, really honest about it, moms matter. Um, and moms are the reason. Uh, moms, uh, you know, before Barack Obama was ever president, he was the son of a mom. Um, you know, before Neil Armstrong ever walked on the moon, he had a mom, you know, that taught him to dream and to, and to believe that he could do and achieve those things that we all saw um, as happening in a moment. But the journey that a lot of us take and a lot of you take come as a result of someone who sowed seeds of empowerment and encouragement into our lives. This is me, right? Six years old with big hair. Um, big hair was in in the 80s, um, or so I'm told, or so mom said. Um, I think it was just probably because she didn't know how to cut my hair. Uh, <laughs> uh, but mom's in the middle. Um, over the course of about 15 years, she had over um, 40 foster care children, um, adopted um, six of us, had um, four of her own, and then remarried um, my stepdad, or got remarried to my stepdad uh, when I was in fourth grade, and uh, he had three girls. So we're a big family of 13 now, but at one point she was a single mom with 11 kids, and um, it didn't matter what we were or who we were or what our color was it, it, like I, I feel like mom was ahead of her time because you know I grew up in a very diverse home and she had brothers and sisters who who thought she was crazy to adopt and or be the mom to you know multi-ethnic children um, but not just multi-ethnic children those with disabilities you know um, my sister Leslie here uh, she has Prater Willie syndrome and so she's 37 years old um, and she has the mind of a three-year-old um, and mom knew when she adopted her that for the rest of Leslie's life, she would have a three-year-old. You know, but she took that on. You know, mothers matter. And without people like my mom, without people like you, I don't know where we would be as, as not just a generation, but as a nation. Um, and then my, my brother, Albert, in the middle there, my favorite brother. Um, growing up, I used to play bus with, bus stop with, with Albert. And so he was in a wheelchair, he's paralyzed from the waist down because of what his mom and, and dad chose when they were um, pregnant with him. Um, but he would, um, he would, I would drive my bike around the, the lawn and he would be the bus stop uh, within his wheelchair and he would tell me when to stop and do different things. And he was my favorite brother and I don't know if it's because he let me roll around in his wheelchair a lot, but um, he remains uh, to this day and he died early in life because of the complications of having spina bifida. Um, but we were all diverse, you know, and, it, and it, we didn't have to be cute and cuddly like I was, right, at, <laughs> at 10 days old. Um, like my brother Tim, he was 16, 17 years old when he came to our family. 
Um, and we were complete when he came. And mom shares that story in the book. Um, and this is her, her quote, you know, if I could just hang in there, who knows what these kids might decide for themselves. And I know that you've all have felt this. If I could just hang in there, who knows what's going to happen, right? Um, um, on the other side of, of whatever you guys are facing. I remember that night we went to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I remember going up to the, to the um, wrought iron gate on the, on the north lawn. I remember looking through that gate and saying, one day I want to be on the inside. And that's crazy talk for a person who was born w- with no money, no connections to any political party, um, not, a, not the best education, knowing nobody that's famous or anything, right? That's crazy talk for a person that was born with, with mental disabilities and had to work through these different things and, and for some reason couldn't get through preschool two times and then for some reason flunked kindergarten. This is crazy talk, okay? But I told my mom, I'm 18, 19 years of old, of age, and she says, what's next? And, and I say, Lucas, I say, Mom, I want to work at the White House. And, and the next thing I told her was even crazier. Uh, I told her that I wanted to fly on this plane. You know, there was this movie that came out in 1997 called Air Force One, right? <laughs> you remember Harrison Ford, the Russians take over the plane. He's like, get off my plane, and he wins the day. And I remember the, the night this movie came out, I was in the very front row of the theater and with all my friends, and, and this is where, what I wanted to be like and, and when, where I wanted to be. And I told my mom, you know, I want to fly in Air Force One, and I had no clue that, you know, that of all the people that ever... Well, let me, let me frame it for you this way. There are probably 300 million Americans right now, right? At any given time, for any administration, Democrat or Republican, um, they'll have about 300 to 500 people that work at the White House. Of those 300 to 500 people that work at the White House, there are probably maybe 20 to 25, maybe, maybe, maybe 30 that get to fly with the president on a regular basis in this way. All right, so... None of that really mattered to an 18, 19 year old. Um, I just knew that there were two of these planes. They can travel halfway around the world. The president has his own apartment on the plane. Um, he has his own kitchen on the plane. He has flat screen TVs. They got um, a office for him, a conference room for him. This uh, plane can withstand a nuclear blast. Those are the things that I cared about, right? Um, so in other words, this is not, a, not Southwest. This is not AirTran. <laughs> Um, and the, uh, the third thing that I told my, my mom that I wanted to try and accomplish was not to be Michael Jordan, but to be close, right? You know, and you can kind of tell I'm like five foot seven on a good day in these heels, right? Um, but I knew that there was more to what you saw on the court. There was more to what you saw uh, with a basketball team. And I remember growing up watching Michael Jordan play and understanding the obstacles that he had to overcome in order to be the best player in his generation, and in probably the current generation as well. You know, this is a person who was cut from his high school basketball team, and, and we would have never known Michael Jordan as the best player to ever play the game if he had just quit, right? But he believed in the possible. I think he wrote, he read in, or wrote in his book that he used to, he had this huge growth spurt um, in, his, in his freshman year of college, so he was actually pretty short. So it's short to him was like five foot nine, five foot ten. Well, I would love to be five foot nine, five foot ten, right? But he said he used to hang from his doorway uh, during the summer to try and grow tall. He just, he just wanted to be, and he had this growth spurt where he grew to six foot six. And we know the rest is history, right? So I told you before about my, my dreams, right? And this is me in the Oval Office um, with the former president. When you think of the number of people that work in the West Wing, there's only about 90 to 100 people that actually work in the West Wing. Um, and so to be able to be in that room was very, very special. Over the course of about five years, served the, the president and you all uh, at the highest levels of government as the African American Outreach Director. Um, so all the relationships with the NAACP and the Urban League and Reverend Jesse Jackson and uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, all those guys. Um, also got to be in charge of professional sports outreach. So that was the fun job. There's no politics involved in that. Um, so whenever an NBA team came, so for example, the very first time I met Shaquille O'Neal um, was in 2006 when the Miami Heat won their first championship. And so he comes into uh, the uh, East Room of the White House, right? And there's him and Dwayne Wade and like Alonzo Mourning are in this kind of this hold room with Pat Riley, who was the coach back then. And uh, I'm there and, and um, 
president walks in, he looks up at Shaq, who's like seven foot one. And he's like, Shaq, you were one tall son of a gun, right? Um, and that was my first experience meeting Shaq. But got to meet all those different guys, whether it was the Patriots who won or the NCAA championships. I got to create all these cool relationships and meet all these people. And, and then I scratch my head and I think, how would a person that started here end up over here? And that's when I say, tell you again, moms matter. And what you do in the lives of your children really, really matters because you could totally flip it for them, right? And then there was this job that had me um, in charge of uh, a region of the country from Missouri all the way to California. So uh, anytime the president went to one of those states, I had to be in charge of his trip. So for like a 27, 28 year old, that's a lot of responsibility. And you know, Blackberry used to be cool. Now we have iPhones, but I had used to have two Blackberries working 16, 17 hour days, but that also meant that I got to fly with the president on Air Force One. All right, so this is us on the way to Nebraska in front of the plane in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I kind of I joke with people when I, when I share these stories. I don't really know where this photo was taken. I just needed proof I was on the plane. <laughs> so, and you aren't really supposed to take photos on the plane. It's only supposed to be the White House photographer that does that. Uh, but heroes, as you all know, turn setbacks into stepping stones. Heroes so into the lives of their children that it doesn't matter where they come from or what the obstacles are. If they're willing to not quit, they're willing to li live life at 212 degrees, that they can be successful, right? 